Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sarah Thrall, and I'm the General and Personnel Manager for the Lexington Philharmonic. I'm glad that everyone could join us here virtually this evening for the fourth installment this season of our Connect Virtual Series. I'm excited for everyone to learn from and get to know our amazing guests this evening. But before I turn it over to Kelly to introduce them, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, even though we can't see everyone who is joining us, we still want to hear and engage with you. So if you're on Zoom, please put any questions, comments, or feedback in the chat or Q&A. And if you're joining us on Facebook, you can engage or ask questions um, of our guests in the comments. Our Connect Talk this evening is being hosted by Lexington Philharmonic's Interim Artistic Advisor, Kelly Corcoran. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Kelly. Thanks, Sarah. Well, good evening, everybody. As Lexville embarks on the final chapter of our season focused on musical storytelling, we wanted to take a moment to connect with two composers that will be featured in our coming performances, Missy Mazzoli and Lauren Loyacono. We'll talk specifically about the works we'll be performing, River Rouge, Transfiguration, and Smothered by Sky, but we'll also get to know Missy and Lauren by discussing, discussing their creative process, how outside influences shape their compositions, and what they think about the role of an orchestra in our current time. So I encourage you to read more about Missy and Lauren at their respective websites, but I'll share a brief introduction here to frame our discussion. Missy Mazzoli was recently named Composer of the Year by Musical America for 2022. Originally from rural Pennsylvania, Missy moved to New York at the age of 25 and has been called by the press Brooklyn's post-millennial Mozart. Her work has been performed by a long list of incredible artists and Missy serves as composer in residence at the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Her work spans from chamber music to opera, and in 2018, she made history when she became one of the of two first women to be commissioned by the Metropolitan Opera. And her music often explores human relationships and the terrain between the familiar and the unfamiliar. So thank you for being with us, Missy. We're glad you're here. And for having me. Yeah, thank you. Lauren, your music is often described as dreaming and dreamy and lilting, vivid and colorful. And Lauren's work has also been performed by a long list of amazing orchestras and artists. And Lauren served as Mellon composer, educator in residence for the 2017-18 season with the Albany Symphony, with whom she has frequently collaborated. Lauren's work ranges from vocal and chamber music to expansive orchestral landscapes. And she's co-founder of the Kettle Corn New Music Concert Series and an active member of the New York New Music Scene. So thank you for being with us, Lauren. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. Well, I'd love to divide our talk tonight into three parts, where first we're going to hear a bit from each of you about your general approach and influences, and then we'll dive into some of your specific works, and then we'll end with this forward-looking discussion on classical music and the role of orchestras. Um, so this is a question for both of you. Our talk tonight is called Industry and Atmosphere as Musical Inspiration, and so I'd love to start there. Um, what is it about our physical environment that you find and uniquely interesting. For example, I know you both either live in New York or have lived in New York, and does that influence your writing? Um, what are the other places you look for inspiration? I don't know who'd like to start. Maybe Missy will start with you. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. Like I, um, I, you know, I remember like 10 years ago, I had a sort of mini crisis because I was listening to an interview with the amazing Icelandic composer Anna Thorvald's daughter. And she was talking about how she's influenced by nature and she's like driving around her amazing studio in Iceland. And like, it just seemed to make so much sense. And like, she had this thing. And, um, and I was sort of like, I've never felt that way about nature. Um, and uh, I was like, well, what's my thing? <laughs> um, and then I realized very quickly that my all of my inspiration comes from people and human relationships, as you mentioned in the introduction, like in the ways in which um, human beings mess everything up, the ways in which we, you know, rise above expectations, the, the ways that we hurt each other and help each other and love each other. And, um, you know, there's just um, infinite, I think there's infinite inspiration in, in human 
relationship. So ev even a work that is about, I think, my, my physical environment um, always has a human element. So it's I, I've spent, you know, all my adult life in cities and um, mostly in New York. Um, and so I get a lot of inspiration from the sort of man made surroundings of a city. And that's that's all about people as well. That's people leaving their mark on on a place and um, manipulating an environment um, in bad, good ways and bad, um, usually bad. Um, but, you know, and so I think that, um, yeah, I think that, that that's where it comes from. And, and when, you know, in the case of this piece, River Rouge Transfiguration, you know, when, uh, there, there's a particular urban landscape that inspires me. It always goes very quickly back to people, um, which I'm sure we can talk about later, but there's always these very human stories behind even an inspiration like that. Yeah, how about for you, Lauren? Yeah, um, you know, I've spent most of my adult life bumping, uh, bouncing back and forth between either being, you know, in you know, in cities, in New York, um, and going back and forth between there and far more just sort of not quite rural, but sometimes even rural environments, just sort of this back and forth between completely surrounded by people and nobody for miles. And I've found that for me, at least the effect is less uh, sort of a direct, it's not like I write one type of music about one type of environment versus the other, but sort of in, in many ways kind of typifies kind of this balance that I'm always trying to look for as a composer between, you know, being around people, sharing ideas, hearing what's going on, this sort of chaotic bustle and sort of the space to hear your own thoughts. Um, and so I found it's, it's not so much about a one-to-one -one relationship, but sort of two necessary halves of a single whole. Um, in terms of where I do find inspiration and you know, talk more about this with the piece as well. Um, you know, I tend to be very, I tend to go towards more of the abstract with music, uh, more sort of gestures and the shapes that are possible with it that words can't quite capture. And so a lot of times I'll find inspiration in pieces from sort of, you know, for example, the piece we're talking about and that uh, Lex will be playing in a few months, Smothered by Sky, sort of these sort of impossible paradoxes of words and that don't quite go together linguistically, but what could that possibly mean musically? Yeah, I love that. Um, so, you know, pivoting now, like from people, buildings, <laughs> environments to our musical landscape and the music we've heard in our lives. Because Missy, I know I heard you say in one interview in the past, like that you listened to a lot of Beethoven when you were younger um, and that you didn't have a lot of exposure to contemporary classical music when you were a kid. So I'm curious for both of you about how this, you know, genre of classical music that you've interacted with or other kinds of music, whatever your soundscape has been through your childhood and your life, how that comes out in your writing as well and how that's influenced your writing too. Yeah, I can start. Um, I, yeah, you know, um, I always, you know, everyone, when people ask like, oh, what were your influences when you were a kid, you know, or when you were young or like even a teenager, um, I automatically go back to Beethoven, Mozart, because that that's that those were like the greatest hit CDs that my parents happened to have. Like these my parents are not musicians. No one in my extended family is a musician. Um and they were sort of like working class people in rural Pennsylvania, you know, and so um the the fact that they had like, you know, these they, they were not gonna have like um I don't know, like the complete works of Louis Andreessen, like in a box set, you know, like this was not going to happen. <laughs> and so, um, but I, I think that um, I like attached myself to those greatest hit CDs with like a ferocious intensity and like I would memorize them and I just fell in love with um, the sound of orchestras, really. It was, these were mostly orchestral works um, that I was hearing. And so I, I think that that has stayed with me and also a sort of like, I gotta say, like a sort of love of um, not not so much tonality. I don't I don't want to say publicly that my music is tonal because it's actually many many layers of things. But there is a layer of tonality there and functional harmony um, that comes out of the Romantic era. And I do think it's from that early influence, from like that being the only music that I heard. I was like, oh, this is classical music. If you want to write for an orchestra, you write like this and you know, this is when I was like 10, 11, 12. This is what I was thinking. So I think that that has 
um, stayed with me. But everything else is sort of like glommed on as, as the years roll on, you know, like I'm, I'm always been incredibly interested in electronic music from the time I was a teenager. I played in punk bands. Um, and again, this is just what was available to me, you know, driving around in a car in Pennsylvania, um, you know, listening to the radio and, um, you know, being around uh, Riot Girl bands in Philadelphia in the late 90s. Um, this all had a really profound influence, but it was also the only stuff that was there. And so I just really took it in, in very intensely. Yeah. Lauren, how about for you? Lauren, I can't remember, what's your instrument? I'm a pianist. Okay, so you're both pianists then. Yeah, right, okay. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, I think that's sort of, you, know, you are what you're exposed to as you're growing mm -hmm. up. And so, you know, my family, um, you know, I grew up you know, about two hours outside of New York. Um, my dad was briefly tried to be a jazz organist, mostly like wedding bands and stuff. And so growing up in the house was, there was a keyboard there eventually a piano there and it's just sort of was something I gravitated towards um and so you know plunked into piano lessons supplemented by whatever my dad happened to be playing either himself or uh you know on at that time cds um but you know again it was just sort of this organic I grew to love again yeah Beethoven Mozart Brahms Chopin, whatever I was playing on the piano, plus whatever happened to filter in. But, you know, it's the sort of thing where, you know, the first time I heard, like, you know, Copeland Rodeo, you know, it was like through my dad playing Emerson Lake and Palmer. So it's always this kind of weird refracted thing. And, you know, I think so much of what I found, the way I found my way into this was because it was through playing. It was through wanting to have things to play with the friends I had available, who was there, who was, could play an instrument. Can we find music for it? No, better write something. Um, and I think that's still something that's very much part of how I approach music is sort of, it all comes from sort of experience as a performer. Yeah, that's a great segue to kind of this process of composition and how, you know, you guys go through that, that process. Do you start at the piano? Do you start with little motific ideas? Are you kind of making little notes? My husband's also a composer. He's got lots of like voice memos <laughs> of different ideas. I would just love to hear a little bit from both of you about your process. Maybe Lauren, you can start. Yeah, um, I kind of do sort of like this dual track where I'll be, there's sort of, you know, there's papers or the more or the, the bones of whatever it's going to be sort of sketching things like lots of colored pencils lots of shapes and then alternating between that and just sitting at the piano and making as much noise as possible and sort of seeing what sticks and what seems to go together and kind of letting it grow from there um you know sometimes you go into it with you know a really clear idea or even sometimes like a title might even come first and that's sort of dictates how, what does that even mean? Sometimes it's the reverse and it's just kind of sort of, you know, groping through the darkness, trying to figure out how do these ideas go together. But I don't find there's one way that every piece gets written. It's just sort of a, how many different angles can you approach it from and what's going to stick with this one? Yeah, I love that. How about you, Missy? Yeah, similar. Like I, um, I'm just like at my desk right now and I have like, traditional staff paper and pencil and like the the tools have been the same for me since I was you know since I started writing when, when I was a kid and um there's something really comforting about that um now yeah I, I'll write down ideas brainstorms sometimes it's just like a list of words or ideas or concepts um and like no notes at all and then I'll start um improvising and then eventually it moves to a notation software program just because it's faster um but and also if I find that like one interesting thing that I've been trying to pay attention to more is like, I, I feel like when I have a good idea or an idea that at least has the potential to turn itself or have me turn it into a piece, um, then I feel it in my body, like before my mind understands it, like, I'm like, yeah, that's it, you know? And it's like this really like basic animal sort of instinctual um, feeling of like, oh yeah, well that one chord could be a whole section or could be a whole piece or could lay the groundwork for something really um, different to come next, you know? And so I've just been, 
I'm not to sound too new agey here. I've been trying to pay, just pay attention to how like it feels when I'm improvising and noticing like when my, my, I feel like yeah, my ears know before my brain does like what has potential. This wasn't a question I had put in the little plan for tonight, but I was just thinking as I hear you both talk, how do you know when you're done with a piece? Cause I think that's a struggle for artists like to, cause we can continue to like fine tune something and come back to it and edit it. Like, is that very clear for you or does it depend on the piece or do you know what I'm saying? Like when to stop and say, okay. <laughs> I have a really short answer for this. So I'll go first. I, I never struggle with like um, worrying about when things are done. Cause I'm always so late that like I'm either like right up to the deadline or the deadline has like whooshed by me and I'm just like in pan full on panic mode. Um, and so, and you know, I've just, I, I don't think I'm alone in that. So I, I hope that I'm not like turning away any potential commissioners out there. Like I, it always works and I'm very conscious of that, of getting things in by the deadline, but it is, it's always down to the wire. So I don't know, I don't think about it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think there's a certain point where if there were no deadlines, nothing would ever be done. <laughs> you just keep fine tuning it forever and ever and ever. So sometimes just a practical, you know, you, you, can, you can obsess over something forever if you don't have something external saying, okay, it's time to put this down. Yeah, time bound. Um constraints can be helpful for sure. Um, I'd love to pivot now to like the pieces that we're gonna be doing with Lex Phil this season. And um, so Missy, your River Rouge Transfiguration will be featured on a Lex Phil concert in February. And Lauren, your Smothered by Sky will be featured on a concert in May. And both of these works were commissioned by the Detroit Symphony. So we're gonna talk about that more in a moment. Um, but Missy, let's start with River Rouge Transfiguration. This was composed in 2013. Um, and you describe the work as the transformation of grit and noise into something massive, resonant, and unexpected. And you talk about how the cityscape and smokestacks reminded you of a massive church organ. Um, so I'd love to just hear more about the work and how the city of Detroit inspired it. And, you know, we'll listen to a little bit of it as well in a moment. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, um, you know, this it's commissioned from the Detroit Symphony. And I had three years before the commission, I was on tour there with my band, Victoire. And um, this was in 2010. And um, it was really just an amazing experience. On the one hand, you know, this is like right post recession. And, and it was sort of it, our whole trip across America was had a, like a tinge of bleakness to it. Um, but in, in Detroit, which is where our final stop, you know, we had we encountered this amazing artistic community um, all the way from like the, the grassroots sort of um, more like punk rock DIY house concert community all the way up to, you know, or over to the Detroit Symphony. And so it just seemed to be things were happening. Um, the, the really vibrant art was happening seemingly everywhere you looked. And I, I just really fell in love um, with the city and um, was interested in the way that the, um, you know, that the industrial past um, left its scars on the landscape, um, how it, you know, and, and just wanted to dig more into that. And I um, was, I, I, when I was in Detroit, I um, read a quote from Henry Ford that described Detroit as America's Mecca. So this is, a, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century um, and, it, that also just got me So reading that quote and making this trip made me really very interested in Detroit's history and its trajectory throughout the 20th century, ending up where I sort of encountered it for the first time in 2010. So as part of all this research, I um, encountered these photographs by Charles Sheeler, um, an early 20th century photographer. And there's one in particular called Crisscrossed Crossed Conveyors, um, which, uh, you know, it like is a picture of the River Rouge plant, auto plant. And then these, there's these conveyor belts that are, you know, you don't have to like read into it too much. It looks like a giant cross um, in the religious sense. And then this this um, factory behind it looks like a pipe organ, you know? And you, again, you don't even have to be, you don't even have to be that imaginative to, to see this image in it. And I thought, oh, wow, like that could be a way into um, musicalizing this this landscape. Um, and yeah, and I, I found I'll, the last thing I'll say, I found this quote, um, you know, 
uh, from Celine's journey to the end of night, um, all around me and afar and above me as far as the sky, the heavy composite muffled roar of torrents of machines, hard wheels obstinately turning, grinding, groaning, always on the point of breaking down, but never breaking down. And so that also led me into um, a sort of sonic idea about what uh, an orchestra piece about Detroit, how that could take shape. I love that. So we're going to listen to a little clip of the piece, which I believe is the end of the work. Um, and this is from a performance by the Detroit Symphony conducted by Leonard Slatkin from 2014. So we'll listen to that. And then um, I'd love to hear if you want to add anything else about kind of the orchestral colors and timbres that we hear in the piece. So Missy, anything you would like to share with us about, you know, what we heard at the end of the work? Sure, yeah, I think you, you got a little sort of taste of these two layers in the works, you know, so there's the sort of um, big swooping melodies, and then there's this, what I refer to as the grit, you know, so which is like percussion, harp, piano, um, you know, uh, you know, there's just this sort of layer of noise. You heard it like a little bit at the end. I don't know if it was possible to hear, but there are these like tubular chimes that are played with mallets rolling. So it's this kind of constant, um, almost like industrial whine going on. And so, yeah, so I think that that's, um, you know, uh, that's a sort of nice little excerpt of it. Um, even though you're missing the whole, like there's like six minutes before that, that leads us to this point. So it's actually kind of cool that you're, you're hearing the conclusion of this journey, um, but you'll have to come to the concert to hear the rest. Exactly right. We don't want to give too much away. <laughs> and then Lauren, we're going to play the beginning of yours. Um, Missy, there was a nice um, comment in the chat about your work too. So um, thank you, Laura, for making that, that chat. So Lauren, um, you described Smothered by Sky as barreling through atmospheric chaos in order to transcend gravity itself. Gravity always threatens to win out. What goes up must come back down. So I'd love to hear from you about this work, Smothered by Sky, which was also commissioned by the Detroit Symphony. Yeah, so um, as I said earlier, a lot of times for me, I tend to draw a lot of inspiration from, I guess I'm just broadly say text because it's everything from poetry to word games to just again, these sort of strange little linguistic puzzles, uh, just something I'm drawn to. Again, just sort of that bridging that gap between concreteness of words and the sort of ineffable nature of music. But, uh, you know, this was a piece where I kind of went into it with sort of a clear image of, of a gesture and of this phrase and sort of no idea what it meant um, of just this sort of rocket trajectory and sort of how it would come back down. So it was really just sort of how to deal with these masses. And so what you'll hear is a lot of sort of this sort of awkward bumbling attempt to kind of get to elevate the orchestra up into something. Uh, again, it, it's, I guess it's, it's just that, it's that imagery sort of the quote you read is sort of just basically where I was going with this, this idea of sort of how do you take something from the most kind of uncomfortable, awkward, shambling, not quite sure what it is and elevate it into something really sort of polished and fine tuned. 
And what does it mean for that polished, fine-tuned veneer to slowly show cracks and sort of get reinfected with that awkward griminess? So again, in this one, we're just going to play the beginning. So we're not going to get, you know, the full, the full <laughs> um, experience. Um, I, oh, yeah, sorry. go ahead. No, go I ahead. Saying, I think from the from what you said, the extra is going to be a lot of that awkward bumbling, trying to escape itself. So awesome. So here is um, again a performance of the Detroit Symphony. This is conducted by Leonard Slatkin from 2017, and we'll listen to just the first um, two minutes or so of this piece. Yay. Um, so Lauren, do you want to tell us anything about what we just heard in terms of like the orchestral sounds and colors and how you were thinking about utilizing them? So yeah, I guess I was sort of thinking of it as sort of, as sort of two uh, endpoints of, again, starting what's the sort of clumsiest, noisiest, sort of crankiest orchestral sound I could come up with on one end and what is sort of the most crystal and fine tuned thing on the other. So start out, you have these sort of this massive featured part for five brake drums, which I promised at the time that I did not make the automotive connection until after the premiere when uh, a friend turned to me and says, oh, is that a Detroit thing? And I said, yes, of course, because I definitely thought of it beforehand. Um, but so yeah, it was a lot of just sort of creating these sort of percussion forward noisy found instruments with sort of shadows of brass and uh, and low strings around them getting up to this point of just sort of nothing but piccolo at the top. So that was sort of setting up that color palette and just sort of seeing how bumpy can the ride be up through it. That's great. And you know, if I haven't said this already, I just want to thank you both for being here because it's so wonderful to have the opportunity to talk with both of you about your pieces and for our audience to have a chance to you know ask questions if they want to and just anyway thank you for your time thank you for your artistic <laughs> you know um creativity and genius and gift and sharing that with lexington and the community here we're really excited for both of these pieces and to be able to hear them in their entirety um i want to pivot to some like bigger 
topics, <laughs> like really big stuff in terms of like future of classical music, um, role of institutions, all of this stuff, um, even mentorship, the next generation, just lots of lots of little things. Um, and so I thought maybe we could start by, you know, talking about the fact that both of these works were commissioned by the Detroit Symphony. Leonard Slotkin was my primary conducting teacher, so I'm very well versed in like his championing of new music and you know the great work he's done in creating opportunities for composers. Um, and both of you share some other commonalities too. You both studied at Yale. I think you both also studied at Tanglewood. I believe that's correct too. Um, and we see the ways in which these major institutions have played a role in your career in musical work, but at the same time, you've also both founded new projects, for example, Luna Lab and Kettle Corn New Music. So we're going to talk about that in a moment, but I want to start by thinking about this ecosystem of contemporary music and what role do larger institutions like the Detroit Symphony or orchestras such as Lex Phil, what role do we play in the support of composers and new music? And why has that been important specifically to you? Um, but you can also feel free to mention like the challenges of major institutions and in operating, you know, in that infrastructure too. Um, Missy, maybe we'll start with you if that's cool. Sure, well, um, I. There's absolutely an, an essential, I mean, I think contemporary work and championing the work of our time and the, and work, music then culture that reflects our time is absolutely essential. I mean, it feels almost like so obvious. It's it's hard to even like really explain why, you know, because we we need this as a society and as, as human beings. Um, this has been part of our, our world since we emerged from the water, um, you know, so, um, and I think that, um, I think that big institutions can do are starting to do more. Um, you know, I, in the last, uh, I'd say like 20 years, I, I see more, um, you know, for example, programs that support younger composers, um, you know, something like the Minnesota Orchestra um, Composers Institute, um, which is they, per, they you know, took works by people in their early 20s and um, early to mid 20s, and then they would perform them by the Minnesota Orchestra. And then that sort of program spawned so many different um, reading programs over and performance programs over the, uh, around the country for emerging artists. And I think the thing to, that or, big, larger organizations need to realize if they don't already is that like one of those opportunities can change someone's life. Um, and it doesn't take much to um, launch a career. And once you have the backing of something like Lexington Phil, you know, Minnesota Orchestra or Tanglewood, or once you go to Yale, I mean, like having that imprint, it doesn't, it's not a, a sure thing that you're going to make it, you know, but it can propel you to the next level. Um, so, and I, I think that, you know, there's obviously so much more to be done in terms of diversity in classical music. Um, and I, th this is why I started um, my program, Luna Composition Lab, which, yeah, is, is extremely small. I mean, we started out with a budget six years ago of $10,000. Um, we got this grant and it has grown to over $100,000 in this short time. Um, but, uh, you know, and we, we're acting as a sort of like feeder organization to um, larger institutions. So if they're um, it's Luna Composition Lab supports young um, female non-binary gender non-conforming composers ages 12 to 18. So super, super young when they're just at the point of deciding um, to be composers. And I wanted to focus on that young um, demographic because I experienced what I just talked about, where like one great opportunity can pivot your life and your career in, in a really positive, incredible way or meeting one mentor um, can change your life. And I think this is where um, women composers of color, we don't have as many access to mentors, as much access to mentors who look like us. Um, so I'm, I'm bringing in a lot of different things, um, but these are all things that I think um, institutions, not just orchestras, but acad academic institutions um, need to pay a little bit more attention to and think about how they can fit into the, the ecosystem. And my, maybe that is about partnering with um, like smaller organizations to sort of who have their ear to the ground and and um, to find that new talent to support. Did I answer the question? I yeah, feel like I, was, sometimes I abandon the question midway through. So. That was great. It was kind of like large institutions, you know, ecosystem. That was great. 
Lauren, how about you? I'm going to apologize because my internet cut out during like this last two thirds of the question. So I'm just going to kind of jump off of what I think great. the question was <laughs> based off of the answer. You're, you're, you're great. Uh, but I mean, I mean, first off, I, I'm going to 100% agree that, you know, things as they are now uh, versus, you know, even 10 years ago, 20 years ago, um, there's just so much more in the way of opportunities. And I think it's also just so there's also so much more, there's so much music happening. This, it's something that's, be, I hope, it seems to be becoming more of an accessible thing. Um, and there's a, there's, there's a hunger for these opportunities. You know, something I, I'm, I imagine, Missy, that you've seen this with Luna, that, you know, how many years, you know, just year to year, the number of applications you get for, the, for a program. Um, you know, same with, with you know, with kettle corn. Um, you know, we started out just sort of as really an opportunity just sort of to you know put on sort of casual music shows just something that we wanted to do where we had like a really sort of uh low-key casual sort of like it's in your living room environment where performers audience composers all feel sort of empowered to talk to each other you know you know now everyone all concerts have been in living rooms for the last two years but that's okay um and but you know I think it just really shows that when you create these opportunities, people take advantage of them. People want to be a part of things. And audiences also really respond to um, hearing, you know, as, as Missy said, music of our own time, music that's a reflection of what we're all thinking about, what we're feeling, what we all experience together as a society. Um, regarding, uh, you know, that ecosystem, you know, I know part of something why that, that is so important is as, you know, as composers, uh, you know, you, everything you do, you really are reliant on the community around you to, to really do anything, um, unless you're just writing for yourself, which plenty of people do and do very well. But if the second you want to go do anything beyond that, you are relying on your neighbors, on your, mentors on those around you to help create something with you. And so um, I know part of why I've like trying to be, you know, doing things like kettle corn, um, another connection. I know uh, Missy and I actually, I think about a decade apart, both were executive director of music at the anthology, uh, which is an organization at, you know, New York uh, annual international festival of new music for early career composers, regardless of aesthetic, regardless of background. Um, so much of that work is because we only get to do what we do because others have supported us. So it's important to show that same support back. Yeah, that's great. Um, so you both have talked a little bit about Luna Lab, Kettle Corn. I don't, I, I would love to hear a little bit more if there's more that you wanna share, like Missy, maybe a little bit more about um, I don't know if there's a specific story of how this has impacted some of the young composers or some partnerships that have worked really well. And Lauren, maybe just a little bit more too about like um, Kettle Corn, how long it's been around, the work it does too. So Missy, we can start with you. Sure, yeah. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, we've been around, we're in our sixth year. We're having our delayed fifth anniversary festival this year because we have been online for two years. But um, Luna Lab has been around for six years. I should mention I started it in partnership with um, the composer Ellen Reed. And um, we're under the umbrella of, um, we, we found a great organizational partner in the Kaufman Music Center in New York. Um, and yeah, no, it, um, we, as I mentioned, like our goal was to support young women of that this the very, very beginnings of their career when they're just getting the inkling to maybe go into music professionally, which often happens when you're a teenager, if not before. Um, and, uh, you know, we um, <clears throat> have already seen the impact of it on their careers. So like our oldest students are now just graduating from college and they've gone to some of the best music schools in the country. So we have a student at Curtis, USC, we have a bunch of them at Rice. Um, you know, we have one at Indiana University and I, you know, we didn't do, we didn't get them in there like single handedly. I mean, these, these were brilliant um, people to begin with, but like we, our program does provide them with tools with which to apply to college, you know, so great recordings of their work, letters of recommendation, advice on where to go. 
um, and what, what makes a successful application. We do mock interviews with them um, as they're preparing for the application process. Um, we have a sort of like composer support network. If something, if someone says something weird to them, they will call us or email us and be like, is this just me or is this weird? And we'll like talk them through that and contract negotiations. So it's a lot of like very real world skills. And we've, um, and we, again, we've seen the numbers in these universities of the numbers of female composers who make it into those programs is, is going up because of this program, because we're, we're like feeding them into these, um, we're giving them a little bit of a boost and feeding them into the, some of the best programs in the country, which again, like, as I said before, like one opportunity or one turn or one encounter with a great mentor can really change your life. And so we're trying to provide that for a whole um, community. And this, this spring, we're having a big festival where we invite all of our alumni to New York. So there's gonna be like 25, at least 25 young um, female identifying non-binary uh, gender non-conforming composers descending on New York <laughs> at once. And it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> I love that. I, I feel like that sense of community is so critical in this field. You know, this is a difficult field. It's challenging. And just having people that are by your side walking that journey with you is really, really critical. Um, Lauren, how about kettle corn? Tell us a little bit more about kettle corn. Uh, so as a kettle corn music, we have been around for 10 years. Uh, primarily, I said, it came sort of me and a couple of friends who were all classmates together from this idea of how do we make uh, a new music concert even more approachable? Uh, how do we take something where we're just providing sort of the same concert experience in terms of, you know, you know, quality of performance and in terms of, you know, some serious curation that you'd get in a concert hall, but sort of make it more of a house party. Um, so, you know, we, like I said, we basically start off the evening with, you know, our, we have drinks, we have snacks, um, clean up events, the composers, the performers before the show, is sort of a reception first. People get to ask questions. There's sort of a lot of communication conversation happening throughout the concert, um, sort of like almost like a big salon. Um, and another thing we do is we really sort of let the, you know, sort of very performer led curation as well. It's sort of, we use it as an opportunity for, you know, hey, what's music that we should know that you're playing? Who's someone we haven't heard of that we, we should know about? Um, what's something that you always wanted the opportunity to play for someone and haven't really found a stage for? Um, and so, you know, needless to say, we haven't been doing quite that format uh, recently and we're hoping to get back to it as soon as possible whenever that happens to be. Um, so we've just been doing digital concerts uh, for the last, you know, just sort of mini 20 minute sets you know, over the last year and a half. Um, but yeah, again, it's just sort of that sense of fostering community um, of sort of, you know, inviting people in, of making, you know, just demystifying the whole thing. So we're getting close to wrapping stuff up. So I do wanna encourage any of our part, um, people that are viewing or anybody that's an audience member. If you have a question, you can put it in the chat and let us know because we are we would love to answer your questions. Um, but I guess maybe one final question to both of you, <laughs> and then of course any final thoughts that you have that you'd like to share too. Um, is this question about relevance, you know, and the the role of classical music in our in our lives, which is like a really big question. Um, but Missy, I heard you say a quote also that was like. Um, that you want to write music that can only be written now and that the news is like an opera. I thought those were two really interesting quotes that I read um, that you had said. And I think that this is like my question, right? Like what is the unique role of classical music in, in the way that we can experience our lives today in, in society today, all that big stuff <laughs> in the future where we're going to, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a, it's like, how much time do we have? Please. Yeah. I, I'm not going to talk too long. That's a really big question. Um, but you know, I mean, like my, one of my favorite things about listening to music from any era, even if it was something that was written like two years ago is, is it connects me to a, a different, another time and place. Um, it connects me to history. It puts me in the position of someone, um, who was writing, you know, again, like two years ago in Nashville or, you know, 300 years ago in Germany. And, um, and it, it, it's transportative and it takes you there. And also I was, 
again, and I don't want to get too new agey, but I do think that music is provides a language for emotions that we don't have, we literally don't have words for. Um, and sometimes that's many emotions on top of each other. And my goal in my music, or one of, one of the things that I'm, um, I, I look for in other, other people's music, I should say, in the music I try to write is, um, is you know music that is sort of all emotions at once it's not clearly explainable or clearly describable but more better reflects the um the con the chaos of our our minds <laughs> so i do think that there's you know in, in that way like classical music needs no explanation or um justification you know but i do think that we have a responsibility to um place that music in, in a modern context so i've just seen so much success with um orchestras like San Francisco Symphony or the New York Philharmonic, where they have these, you know, for example, a late night show, um, which has speaking and modern music combined with music of the past, with class standard classical rep. Um, and you're, you hear the older music in a new way. Um, so I do think we have, we have a responsibility to be conscious and be curators of that older work. Um, and that will help people feel that that is also relevant. I, I feel like a Beethoven symphony is just as, is, is extremely relevant to our time, especially now, probably. So I'll just leave it at that. The scratches the surface. Yeah. That's a lot of great stuff. Lauren, how about you? Yeah, I, I think this question of, you know, relevancy of classical music sort of relies on, you know, what is classical music as even a genre, you know, in an era where you can listen to anything at any time at a click. Um, you know, I know a lot of my students and, you know, a lot of younger composers I know don't really listen in the way that, you know, we might have when we were growing up. Instead, it's sort of sort of put something on YouTube and let it autoplay and that take you from the next thing to the next thing. And you might start, you know, with a Beethoven sonata and wind up with like, just like, you know, noise punk, like just in the same, just based on whatever is getting generated algorithmically. So sort of the sense of what, you know, it's interesting talking about putting things into context. Um, I feel like it's really easy to run into a lot of music without context today. And I think that's sort of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you know, a lot of nuance gets lost without context, but at the same time, I think more than ever, sort of anything can be approachable to anyone depending how they find it, so. Yeah, and I think that's a great segue to the question that Laura had put in the chat. And she um, was talking about how a lot of the ways in which we listen today is through digital methods, whether that's on YouTube or our phone or you know whatever. And the question of, you know, as composers, how can we promote live concert music and the importance of hearing music live and in person? Um, and of course, these are big giant questions. Like I also teach and sometimes I have um, had my students listen to four minutes and 33 seconds by John Cage and probe into the question of what is music, all of this stuff. And I've heard so many responses, even things like music is only stuff I can listen to on my phone or, you know, just like the way in which we define music today is evolving all the time, right? And has been for centuries. But um, I guess this question of like live performance, how important is that? Like being in the room with live musicians in front of you and what can we do to continue to make space for that in our lives? I think that's Laura's question. I I can go, I mean, I don't, so I I know that, okay, we're, we're, we're like two years into a pandemic where we haven't been able to be, experience live, that much live music. And so I maybe, I think right now it feels like it's going away, um, but I don't think so. I, I, I don't think, I feel like um, I'm 41 now. And ever since I was like five, um, people have been like, well, AI is gonna take your job away from you. And I've been like waiting for the robot army to come ever since. And it's like the never, like, like my youngest students, you know, love the feeling of being live with musicians in a room. So I feel like just giving them a taste of that, again, post pandemic, like we're in this weird space right now, but like, I feel like everyone's in agreement about the power of live music and the ritual of being at a performance together. Again, we're going back to like basic human needs, um, the need to tell stories, have your own life reflected in the art around you, and the need to be in a room together, experiencing something together. And I don't think that that will ever, ever go away, ever. And I, if anything, I've just seen it, and as Lauren and I were talking about, I've seen more and more of that happen um, since I've been 
uh, on this journey as a professional composer. I see more and more opportunities. I see more and more young people starting ensembles and bands, whatever you want to call it, or solo projects and like creating concert series um, and showing up to things, showing up to the Met Opera. I mean, even like the stodgiest venue. Um, I just, I love them. They employ me. It's great. I love them so much. But like, you know, the, the, talk about classical music, like you think of the, that building. And so I, I just think that it's about giving people that first taste of live music, um, you know, whether that's a punk show or taking someone to their first orchestra show, um, putting them like go, taking them to a rehearsal. And then I think people will be will be hooked, even though right now it feels like we're never going to get back to that. We definitely will. Yeah, I, I don't know anyone who, you know, we've kind of had this unfortunate grand experiment of do you need live music? I don't know a single person who at this point in the pandemic is thinking, I'm so grateful that I get to hear all my concerts on Zoom. It, it, you know, everyone's eager to be back in a hall. I, I I think there's, it's it's just, it's it's two different things to hear music on recording versus hearing music in a hall. And I actually don't think it's necessarily one is better than the other. Like there's plenty of, like there are albums that I'll just put on and want to listen to, just headphones, best sound system possible, whatever. And there are pieces that, you know, in a hall, you know, I can get the full scope of them that I would never listen to, you know, just sitting on my own at home. I think they're just, they're just two different animals. And I think it's okay for that to be the case. And I just, I don't think you can replace live performance with that. And I just don't, I, I, I think what, as, as Missy said, when people get a taste of that and they can actually see that difference, hear that difference, feel that difference, I think it's sort of self-explanatory from there. Yeah. And I love your point, Lauren, that there's a place for all of it, you know, that there's a place to enjoy recorded music and, it, and it's a different, it's, they're just totally different experiences. Um, okay, so we are out of time and I just wanna ask you before we wrap up, if there are any final thoughts that you would like to share um, and then, you know, I'll just say a grand thank you <laughs> at the end, but any final thoughts? I mean, we're just so grateful to both of you for being here. No, just so grateful to be here. Um, and thank you so much for having us. Thank you for programming our work. Um, and this is just fantastic. And even if it's over Zoom, any any chance to connect with people over music is like really, I'm really, really grateful for it. So thank you. Thanks, Missy. Basically what Missy says, is just wonderful to be here talking about music, getting questions from folks and uh, just yeah, thank you. Thank you for playing our music. Yay. Well, I am so excited for people in Lexington to be able to hear your pieces this spring. Um, and I encourage everybody to learn more about Missy and Lauren at their, their websites and you can listen to more of their music and just become super fans <laughs> of both of them. And I think Sarah's putting in the chat um, the links to the programs so you can learn more about the specific programs and dates and times and how to get tickets and everything there. Um, but Missy and Lauren, thank you so much for your time. I hope we continue to talk more and I know everybody's going to love your music. So thank you again for being here. Bye everybody. <laughs>